Uh, we are in this series um, called, uh, again, In the World, and it's been uh, already, it's been a, a, a challenging series. And uh, I kind of tell you up front today, I, I set a new record today for the most number of slides for a Sunday morning. Um, so lots that we have to go through today and a lot of scripture. And I kind of share that uh, unapologetically that we're going to be in God's word a lot today. Um, so if you got your Bibles, you can kind of flip to Daniel chapter 4, and that's where we'll be today. Um, this week has kind of been a little bit of a reflective week for me, and, and some of you know, most of you know, uh, that one year ago I had a heart attack. And so um, for me, that was kind of a, a very unexpected, and, uh, and, you know, it just it was really kind of a, an experience that... Um, it was tough, and, and just to, honestly, I didn't didn't really see it coming, and you kind of dealing with all the motions and trying to figure all, out all this stuff, and if it's going to happen again, all that. So lots of doctor's appointments last year, uh, new medicines, all this stuff. And I went this past week and had my one-year follow-up with a cardiologist and, and really got a good report, and everything's good, and um, you know think they've got everything under control and all that stuff. But... He, it really made me think a lot, and I just I said, it's kind of been a reflective week a little bit, and for me, and I think medical emergencies do that. They, they kind of make you reflect. They make you realize very quickly that you aren't in control, and um, I think for me, it, it just, uh, it's, it was very humbling. Uh, it's very eye-opening. It made me realize that the world really didn't revolve around me, um, honestly, and, and, you, and that's, a, that's a good thing, right? It makes you realize that, you know, uh, this church would have been perfectly fine if, uh, if, if the heart attack was more severe. Uh, you know, God's got this. And God, you know, you see that no matter what happens, that God really is in control. It's taught me that I need to trust God more, and I've got to quit trying to control things myself. It's taught me that I really do need to take every advantage to make a difference in the lives of people for the kingdom of God. It gives me a, kind of a new urgency. It's taught me that I need to listen more. It's taught me um, that my opinion is not nearly as important as what God says. And, and that's really what I want to focus in and talk about this morning. Whenever we do a series, we, we really focus in on our culture around us. Um, I get asked all the time, well, Mike, what do you think about this? Or did you see that in the news? Or what do you think about this? Or what do you think about this? And, and I, I'm learning that my response needs to be, it really doesn't matter what I think. We need to be going back to, to, to thinking about what does God think? And what does God say about it in his word? And if we can do that, if we can continually go back to God's word to, to learn and, and continually go back to, to God's word to challenge us, I think we would be so much healthier as a, not only as a church, as individuals, as a community, right? If we learn to just start asking, well, what does God think? What does God think? And that kind of leads me to my first point this morning. If you're following along in your notes, this is something that we have just got to, to find. We've got to learn this. And it's always tough, but we need to hear it over and over again. It's simply this. God is God, and I am not. <laughs> That's where we've got to understand that. And, and this is so important. I even want us to say it together this morning. Okay? I, I want us just to be on the same page to start out. Let's say it all together. Everybody, it, God is God and I am not. That's good to hear. We've got to learn that. We've got to kind of come to an understanding of that. We need to realize that, that, that God is God and that, that he is the one that's on the throne. We aren't the ones that, are, that get to make all the decisions and choices and control everything in life. It's really up to God. And as mentioned uh, over the last couple of weeks as we've started this series, um, um, that there's a couple of books that I've uh, kind of read and kind of were the, the catalyst for this series. One of them was The Daniel Dilemma by Chris Hodges, uh, by the pastor. And he said this. He said, we live in a culture and that social media obsessed with personal opinions, comments, and likes, and retweets. We've become the center of our own little universes, and virtually everything around us reinforces the delusion that we can and we should control our own destinies, and that we should offer our two cents on how everyone else is controlling theirs. We seem to think that everyone's opinion matters, but that whoever can defend theirs the best or shout the loudest wins. 
And, and so what we've got to do, we've got to learn if God is God, we've got to learn to trust him. And, and we need to trust him enough to let him lead our life. And this morning, we can learn from the book of Daniel about the dangers that happen when we put ourselves in the driver's seat of life instead of allowing God to lead and direct us. You see, I'm afraid that there's so many people, we go through life and we say, God, yeah, I want you to be Lord of my life, but we hold on to the steering wheel. We hold on to control everything, and we don't allow him to really lead us through life. And so let's review the last couple of weeks. Here's what we talked about the first week in, in Daniel chapter 1, that culture has a goal, and that goal is to try to change our identity. Culture wants to, to, to make us forget who God really is and who God created us to be, and culture tries to shape and to mold us into something that really goes against God's design. And so we talked about that in Daniel chapter 1. Uh, last week, we talked about the culture's greatest test from Daniel chapter 3, that culture is constantly trying to pull us away from, worship, from worshiping God. And that instead, it, we see all these idols in life that we kind of build up and, and, and lift up and end up worshiping them instead of worshiping God. And so today, we kind of want to take it to the next chapter, and we want to look at Daniel chapter 4, and we want to talk about culture's greatest sin, and that sin is pride. That sin is pride. Now, pride is one of those words that I think in our culture today, it's become synonymous with self-confidence, with strength, with strength, uh, with character. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of one of those virtues almost that we lift up. But in reality, when we look at the definition, we realize it's not a virtue at all. Uh, it's a feeling, the, the, the dictionary defines it as a feeling of or deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's also can be described as conceit, right? That's kind of the underlying uh, connotation there, the conceit or egotism or vanity, uh, it's all those things that we look at that, that really when we see those qualities in somebody else, it, it kind of repels us. When we see pride in someone else, um, we look at it and we go, man, I just don't want to even be around a person that is prideful. But the problem is we don't realize it when we have it in ourselves. Now, C.S. Lewis wrote in the book Mere Christianity, one of my favorite books, he calls pride the great sin. And it's with good reason he calls it that. And, and this is what he said. There is one vice of which no man in the world is free, which everyone loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine that they are guilty of themselves. I've heard people admit that they are bad-tempered or that they cannot keep their heads about girls or drink or even that they are cowards. I do not think I've ever heard anyone who is not a Christian accuse himself of this vice. And at the same time, I very seldom met anyone who was not a Christian who showed the slightest mercy to it in others. There is no fault that makes a man more unpopular, and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves." And the more we have it in ourselves, uh, the more we dislike it in others. The vice I am talking of is pride or self-conceit. And the virtue opposite to it in Christian morals is called humility. According to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil, is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. And I want us to realize this. When we start talking about pride, I think our first reaction is, yeah, I know some people that are prideful. Yeah, but I'm pretty humble myself. And as soon as we say that, we have just proved that we struggle with it too, right? The moment you get to that point, you say, well, I'm not prideful. You just showed that you are. And so the reality is, when I talk about pride, I'm talking about a subject that touches every person in this room because our heart just naturally flows, right, to thinking more of ourselves and kind of building ourselves up, and, and, and we just naturally kind of fall into this danger of pride. And the, the reality is pride leads us into so many other sins, and it does it kind of 
quietly. He does it quickly. It does it without us even realizing it. Now, God absolutely hates pride because what it does, it, it just shows that we don't really put God in his rightful place in our life. Psalm 10 says this. It says, in his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. And so that's what pride does to us. It makes us think that we don't really have a room for God, that there's no need for God, that we can control things on our own. Proverbs 8 says, all who fear the Lord will hate evil, but therefore I hate pride and arrogance, corruption and perverse speech. So, uh, Proverbs 11 said, pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Um, Proverbs 16, 5, we see this over and over again throughout Scripture. The Lord detests the proud, they will surely be punished. In the New Testament, James says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And that, that word opposed is like this military term that like you rage and battle against. It's not like God just doesn't like it. No, like God battles against this. God battles against the, 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 the pride in our lives. And not only did James say it, Peter said the exact same thing. In, in 1 Peter, we read, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to to the humble. Do you think God's trying to get our attention about a problem here? And, and, and here's the thing. I'm thinking back in, in my mind through all the, the sermons I've heard, and I just don't remember pride being talked about a lot. I just don't, rem I just don't think this is something we focus in and zero in on uh, that enough in the church. And so we see how dangerous his pride is. We see that God hates pride. And here's our problem. We very rarely see pride in ourselves. It's a sin that hides in our blind spots. So that's when we come to a story in the Bible like this. I just want to ask us, will we allow God to speak to us? I think the danger in, in studying, especially the Old Testament, is sometimes we, we approach it like a historical narrative. We approach it and we see a story and we think, oh, this is a good story. I, I, I want to learn the history behind it. And, and I want to like read about it and like, okay, I know this Bible story. And so we read it and we think, oh, I, I learned a new Bible story. I learned something new. But we, we, we make a mistake when we don't take what we read and apply it to our life today. And so what I want us to do is when we read this story about Nebuchadnezzar today, that we don't just read it and say, oh, that's a good story yeah, yeah, I, I learned a little bit this morning. I learned another Bible story. I want us to take this and say, what does it change in my life today? When I read this, how does, it, how does it affect me? How does it change me? Hebrews 4 says this is what Scripture does to us. It's not just a dry history book. It's an active. It, it's the Word of God. It's alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. It cuts between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. And so that's my, that's my prayer today, that as we read this, we would allow God to kind of just open us up and speak into our life in a way that when we leave here, we'll say, not that, oh man, I feel so good today, but when we leave here and we feel convicted of sin, we leave here and we realize that God is shaping us and molding us and transforming us to be more like Jesus. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at the story of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. Max Lucado, in one of his books, he kind of gave us a little background on him. He said, King Nebuchadnezzar had no peers. He was the uncontested ruler of the world of the 6th century B.C. Babylon, his city, rose out of the desert plains like a Manhattan skyline. The hanging gardens of Babylon, which legend says he built for his wife, were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. His royal palace was immense. It walls, its walls were 387 feet high and 87 feet thick. It was said that four chariots could ride abreast on top of the walls. The mighty Euphrates flowed through the city. Its population reached two million people. You know, sometimes I think we read stories about these ancient civilizations and these cities in the Bible, and, and, and we think, oh, well, you, we, kinda, we, we, we don't have a picture in our mind of what it was really like. 
It boasted temples, terraces, and palaces, and all of this was under the 43-year rule of Nebuchadnezzar. He was a part oil baron, part royalty, part hedge fund billionaire, and were he alive today, he would dominate the Forbes list of billionaires. Um, and But what we see is that all this was about to end, and we read about it, and I think the key verse for understanding chapter 4 is in verse 25. We see that Nebuchadnezzar had a vision, and we'll talk about it this morning, and he needed it to be interpreted, and Daniel interpreted it, and this is what he told him. Uh, this is kind of the judgment that was about to hit Nebuchadnezzar. He said, you will be driven from human society, and you will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow, and you will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until, and this is, this is the key here, until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world, and he gives them to anyone he chooses. In other words, until you learn that God is God and you are not. That's what he's saying right here, right? That, that this is what Nebuchadnezzar has to learn, that God is the one that is in control. And so what, did, what was the reason for this judgment? It was simply pride. It was simply pride. King Nebuchadnezzar, he was all about King Nebuchadnezzar. And so Daniel was sent to warn him, and, and so this is, is what happens. Daniel 4, it's kind of an autobiographical letter. It's, it's a little bit different. The structure is a little bit unique. The first three verses um, are kind of the end of the story. And so it's King Nebuchadnezzar. He's talking about what he has learned through this. At the, the, the first three verses, he's saying, this is what I've learned. And then he backs up and says, this is how I got to this place. And so he backs up and tells the story of what led him. And then the end of the chapter kind of he reaffirms what he says at the beginning. And so let's kind of dig in this morning. I, I told you um, um, it's going to be a lot of scripture this morning. We'll read through it. So if you've got your Bibles, you definitely can flip uh, along with us. You can read on the screen as well. Uh, chapter 4 takes place about 20 to 30 years after chapter 3 in the fiery furnace. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he's seen God display his power over and over again. By now, he should have learned, um, and this is what he learned at the end of chapter 4, but we're, that's what we're starting off with. Uh, Daniel 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how powerful his wonders. His kingdom will last forever uh, and, and his rule through all generations. Now, this is pretty remarkable. I, I've shared how evil Babylon was, how this was a, just a pagan city. Uh, you, this was a city that came in and captured uh, the uh, the Israelites and, and captured them and took them into captivity and exile into uh, Babylon. Uh, and this is a king now that has reached the point finally where he says, I know who God is. I know what he can do. He is the true God. He's going to rule forever. His kingdom will not end. This is remarkable that he would find himself in a place where he would be praising the God of the Israelites. This is amazing uh, because this is a king, right? And, and you can study archaeology. You can study all uh, the facts outside the Bible. And what we see, there's so much evidence that points back to there was a King Nebuchadnezzar who ruled in Babylon. We know that for a fact that this guy actually existed. He actually lived. He actually ruled, right? And what we see here is we see how he ended up. We see that he ended up and saying, okay, I give up. Uh, I, know who I know who God really is. I I I've seen it. I've experienced it. And I know how powerful he really is. So how did he get there? Let's read the story. And in verse 4, he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity. So right here, we start seeing some of the problems here that, that, that led to his pride. But one night, I had a dream that frightened me. 
I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in my bed. So I issued an order calling in all the wise men of Babylon so that they could tell me what my dream meant. When all the magicians and chanters and astrologers and fortune tellers came in, I told them the dream, but they could not tell me what it meant. And at last, Daniel came in before me, and I told him the dream. He was named Belteshazzar after my God and the spirit of the holy gods in him. And I said to him, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that the, no mystery is too great for you to solve. Now tell me what my dream means. And so he gets ready to tell him another dream. And the king had a, a dream here. And, and I don't know about you, when I sleep and I, I don't typically remember my dreams, right? Very rarely do I remember my dreams. And when I do, they're really, really weird. Okay, can anybody relate? And, and so he's about to tell what his dream was. And, and he's about to try to figure, and he's like, he brought in, the first thing he did, he brought in all his magicians and astrologers and all, and they don't have a clue what the dream meant. And that's his first mistake, right? He already knows that Daniel can interpret dreams. We've already established that fact leading up to this. Daniel was able to do that. And I think that King Nebuchadnezzar was afraid of what Daniel might tell him. So he went to, to people who he thought would tell him what he wanted to hear. They couldn't tell him what it meant. He finally shows up to Daniel, and he explains the dream to him. Here's the dream, and it was a weird one, right? Now, I'm just telling you, if I heard this dream, if someone came up to me and told me a dream like this, here's what I would tell them. Here's my interpretation. You need to lay off the burritos late at night because <laughs> that's just messed up. That's what I would say to him right here. This is his dream. While I was laying in my bed, this is what I dreamed. I saw a large tree in the middle of the earth. The tree grew very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. It had fresh green leaves, and it was loaded for fruit, uh, with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade, and birds nested in its branches. All the world was fed from this tree. Then as I lay there dreaming, I saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven. This is what the messenger shouted. Cut down! the tree and lop off its branches shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit chase the wild animals from its shade and the birds from its branches but leave the stump and the roots and the ground bound bound with a band of iron and bronze and surrounded surrounded by tender grass let them be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the wild animals among the plants of the field for seven periods of time let him have the mind of a wild animal instead of the mind of a human for this has been decreed by the messengers. It is commanded by the Holy One so that everyone may know that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world. He gives them to anyone he chooses, even to the lowliest of people. And so he said, Belteshazzar, Daniel, that's the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now tell me what it means, for none of the wise men of my kingdom can do so. But you can tell me because the Spirit of the Holy Gods is in you. And what's interesting, again, he went to the astrologers first. They couldn't tell him. He finally goes to Daniel, and, and he asked Daniel, he said, this is my dream. It's a little weird, i got to admit, but maybe you can help me with it. Uh, you've shown before that you can interpret dreams, so help me with my dream. And, and here's his interpretation. Upon hearing this, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, was overcome for a time, frightened by the meaning of the dream. This, this like disturbed him when he heard it. Then the king said to him, Belteshazzar, don't be alarmed by the dream and what it means. And he replied, I wish the events foreshadowed in this dream would happen to your enemies, my lord, and not to you. Now, this is interesting to me. He's in captivity, a slave, and yet he still he still cares about the evil king Nebuchadnezzar. And what we've seen is maybe Nebuchadnezzar has softened a little bit. Maybe he's grown in his understanding of who Daniel's God really is. And so when Daniel heard this, it, it like concerned him. It bothered him. And he was actually didn't even want to tell Nebuchadnezzar because he didn't want, uh, he didn't want to share this with him. And he said, um, the tree that you saw was growing, it was tall and strong, it reached high into the heavens, it had fresh green leaves, all, these, all this imagery, the wild animals in its shade, the birds nested in its branches. Verse 22, that tree, your majesty, is you. For you have grown strong and great, your greatness reaches up to the heaven, your rule to the ends of the earth. And then you saw a messenger, and this is all the weird stuff that the messenger says, and cut down the tree, destroy it, leave the stump though, 
uh, and all this stuff about the seven periods of time and the, the wild animals and the seven periods of time um, we think meant seven years. Uh, this is what the dream means. Verse 24, your majesty, and what the Most High has declared will happen, my Lord, my King. Verse 25, you will be driven from human society. This is the key verse, I said, right? You will live in fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow. You will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods or seven years uh, will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. But the stump and the roots of the tree were left in the ground. This means that you will receive your kingdom back again when you have learned, I love this phrase, when you will, will have learned that heaven rules he's telling him this is what's got to take place for you to get your kingdom back you got to learn who god is that god is god and that you are not and he gives him one final warning in verse 27 king nebuchadnezzar please accept my advice right please accept my advice break from your wicked past be merciful to the poor and perhaps then you will continue to prosper and so what I want to talk to you today about two paths that lie before us. We've got the pathway to pride and the pathway to humility. And we all are faced with these uh, choices that we make that will either, either lead us uh, more and more down this road to pride or more and more down the road to humility. And so I kind of want to share a little bit from this story what we can learn about each. Here's the first uh, step that we take that leads us on the road, leads us on the pathway to pride. Uh, we start down that road when we think that we don't need God. The pathway to pride, thinking that you don't need God. This was a problem with Nebuchadnezzar. And why was it? Well, in verse 4, if you remember, I kind of read over it very quickly. <clears throat> it just said this, Nebuchadnezzar was living in, the, in his palace in comfort and in prosperity. Here's the problem. When we're in comfort, when we're in prosperity... We don't think about God a whole lot. When our bills are paid, when our family's healthy, when we have enough to eat, when we have a roof over our heads, we really, for, for, for many people, we, you see people just kind of get comfortable with life. They think, oh, well, I, I'm doing just fine on my own. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to really spend time reading my Bible. And, and why? They, they kind of view God like this, uh, like this, uh, not, this spiritual 911 that they'll call upon God when they're in their, in their time of crisis. They'll call upon God when they need Him, but for right now, I'm doing just fine on my own. And there's danger in that when we are comfortable, when we are prosperous. And we see this, um, and studies will show, we see this in our country. In times of economic prosperity, church attendance goes down. But in times of economic struggle, church attendance goes up. Why is that? Well, it's because people think that they realize that they need God. We see this when t in times of peace, church attendance goes down. What happens after a terrorist attack? What happens after a, 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 a calamity or a crisis in a city? What happens? People come to church. Why? Because they want comfort that God provides. And, and so we see people kind of call upon God when they need him, but most of the time as things are going good in their life, they think, I don't need God. I've got, I'm doing just fine on my own. And, and, and what Chris Hodges said in his book, Daniel Dilemma, he said, pride is this gateway sin that offers an open doorway for our enemy to drop in and tell us just how great we are and how we really don't need God. It whispers, hey, religion is just a crutch for all those weak people. You're strong. You're better than that. You're in control of your life. So these lies embolden us to question God and to start thinking that he doesn't really know what he's doing. It, starts, makes, us, it makes us believe that we know more than God knows. But you and I know that that's just simply not true. God's word could not be clearer about the magnificence, the power, and the holiness of God or about the sinfulness, the weaknesses, and the limitations of humanity. Pride is a massive problem that usually creates a chain reaction of massive consequences. That's why the issue of pride appears again and again in the prophetic books of the Bible. It leads to so many other sins, uh, sinful choices and sinful actions. 
And so what we see here, uh, this, under, this thinking that, hey, we don't really need God. I'll just, when I'm in trouble, then I'll, and we see this in, in young people, you know, well, when I get older, then I'll make time for God. It, it's just that attitude that, that we've got things under control and we'll, we'll make time for God later. That, that's the first step to, to pride. Here's the second step to pride. It's taking credit for things that God has blessed you with. When we get to the point in life when we start saying, you know what? I'm doing pretty good. Look at, all, look at what I've done. Look at what I've bought. Look at what I've earned. Man, I deserve this. Y'all ever say that? You know, it, it's an easy trap to fall into. We start take, we look around and we think, man, you know, I, I'm doing pretty good. I, I've done well. And we start patting ourselves on the back and, and then we start trying to justify stuff. I mean, I fall into this trap all the time. I was looking at... You know, the iPhone 10 last week, and they're getting ready to come out with a new one here in a couple weeks, and I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I really could use a new one. I really deserve a new, I need a new iPhone. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to get me one, and, and you know, I, I, I've earned it. I'll just get me a new iPhone. And, and then it's like, you're like, oh, wait a minute here. I forget, we forget, that everything we have is on loan from God. We don't own it anyway. He's just blessed us to manage it for a while. Right? It's just on loan from him. Um, we're his stewards. We're his managers. And then we start thinking, okay, is that the best use? Is that what God wants, not what I want? That's the, that's the trap of pride. We start thinking, look at me. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've accomplished. Look at how hard I work. I deserve this. And we stop thinking, right? We stop thinking about uh, our role in light of what God wants us to do. God may want me to have a new iPhone. I'm praying he does, but that's a question for him, not for me, because God is God and I am not, right? That's, that's, what we, that's, the, that's the mentality we've got to, to grow into. We've got to start thinking about that. Uh, when we continue in this story, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar, he was faced with a choice. Uh, he, 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 Daniel just gave him one last warning. Hey, you need to turn from your, your prideful ways. You need to think about the poor. You need to think about how you, can, uh, how you can leverage your power, how you can leverage your resources, not for your benefit, but for the sake of others. Now, that's the problem with pride. He was leveraging everything he had for his own benefit instead of leveraging it for the sake of others. In verse 28, we see what happened. 28 says all these things did happen to Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, he didn't listen. 12 months later, so he had 12 months to kind of think about this dream and this vision. He was taking a walk on the flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon. He looked out across the city. <laughs> listen to what he said. Look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. In other words, he's just walking around saying, look at me. Look at how awesome I am. Look at what I've accomplished. I mean, and he's walking around looking at the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world. He's looking at this huge palace. He's looking at all this stuff and just saying, I'm pretty cool. Look at me. I, I'm, I'm doing pretty well for, for, for myself. And we see, see what happens. It doesn't sound like humility at all. While these words were still in his mouth, verse 31, a voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. You'll be driven from human society. You're going to live in the fields with the wild animals. You'll eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. That same hour, the judgment was fulfilled, and Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. He ate grass like a cow. He was drenched with the dew of heaven. He lived this way. Get this, this is kind of one of those word pictures you're like, ooh. He lived this way until his hair was as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. We're talking about the richest, most powerful person in the world. I mean, they, multi-billionaire, right? He, this guy is, the, again, the most important person in his mind, at least in the world, 
And the next thing we know, he goes from walking on top of his palace, adoring all of his things, all of his possessions, to literally going insane, thinking he was a wild animal, trying to eat grass. And there's all sorts of psychological terms for, for what the people think that happened to him. But all I know is this guy just, he went insane. He completely lost his sanity. He went out. And, I mean, just think about somebody like that, uh, the, the richest person in the world, sleeping outside, trying to eat grass, thinking he was a cow. There's a problem here. And think about how that affected the whole culture, the whole society. And, and here's your king, and he just went bonkers. And they, know, they don't know why. And so that's, we, we see this, this pathway. We see the pathway that, that when we follow it that leads to pride, we see that pride always has consequences. We either humble ourselves or we will be humbled. And so what we see here is God humbled King Nebuchadnezzar. But the story doesn't end there. There is a pathway that leads to humility. There's also a path that we can learn from. So let's look at that. Let's look at how the story turned out in verse 34. After this time had passed, the seven periods of time, Nebuchadnezzar looked up to heaven. So how did he, how did he become humble? The first thing he did, he just looked up. He looked up. And my sanity returned. I praised and I worshiped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting. His kingdom is eternal. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? And verse 36, when my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and my glory and my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored as head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. So now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All of his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. And so my question, do you want to see your sanity restored in a crazy culture, in a crazy world today? Are you feeling like things are just kind of going out of control in your life? Then, then, then maybe this pride is something that you're dealing with and you've not realized it. Maybe you need to get back on the pathway to humility. So I want to give us a few steps how we can kind of continue down that path. Here's the first thing we've got to do. If we want to be on the pathway to humility, we've got to exalt God as the king of of your life we've got to get our eyes focused back up on who god is and on what he has done you see i look around there's a lot of people that say well i want jesus to be my lord and my savior and and maybe you, you'll hear that phrase, i want jesus to be my lord and Savior." and and, and the, they they like the savior part but they're not too high on the lord part what does lord mean it means king master ruler it means that you've submitted your life, and now instead of you kind of saying, okay, I'm going to make all the decisions for my life, it means that you get out of the way and you say, God, you make the decisions for my life. It means, God, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to be the king. I want you to be the master over me, and I'm just going to live my life in submission to you. And remember that verse 25, that, that the key verse, until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. And that's what we've got to learn. We've got to learn God is God. We are not. He's in control. He's on the throne. He is king. Psalm 145 says this, I will exalt you, my God and my king, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Is that how we live our life? Do we live our life in such a way where we're just constantly exalting God and lifting up God, lifting Him up and saying, this is who God is and this is who I am. I know my place, right? And just humbling ourselves before the Lord and realize He knows best. This is one of the most important things to stand strong in culture. Because culture is going to try to, 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 to take God off, out of the rightful place he deserves in our life and tell us, you don't have to do that. You don't have to believe that. God doesn't really know what he's saying. God doesn't really know what he's doing. God, we, Scripture doesn't really mean that. Scripture doesn't really say that. Just do what feels right. And what we do is we, put our, we exalt ourselves. 
We exalt ourselves instead of exalting God as the king of our life. I'm reminded of the verse that's been kind of the theme verse for the National Day of Prayer numerous times. It's 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It's a verse about humbling ourselves. If my peop- then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will restore their land. You see, this act of exalting God starts when we humble ourselves. I've heard it said that when we get on our face before God, we don't have far to fall. And I'm afraid so many of us, we don't get on our face before God too much. And so we're setting ourselves up for a fall. And so the act of simply coming before God in prayer, it just indicates a willingness to trust God, to listen to, to His plan for our life. So that's the first step. Here's the second. Not only do we humble ourselves, we acknowledge that God is in control. We just acknowledge, okay, God, I mean, and we may have to do this verbally. We may have to just, we have to just get to the place in our life where we say, God, you're the one in control. And these first two just go hand in hand. Um, we have to realize that God has given us everything. So seven years have now passed. Nebuchadnezzar, he lifts his eyes towards heaven. He recognizes that God is is the king. And notice that his sanity was restored when he acknowledged that God was in control. When he acknowledged that God was sovereign, that God was the one who made the decisions, that that God was the one who was the true king, his life kind of came back to normal. He learned who he was. He lived seven years of his life in a wilderness, and finally he confesses who God, he acknowledges who God really is, and we see God kind of pull the pieces back together. And I'm telling you, no matter how broken your life is right now, what I see in this story is God can pull the pieces back together. When we humble ourselves, when we acknowledge him as the ruler, as the Lord of our life, he can pull the pieces together. And your life may be broken and in shambles, but God wants to pull them back together. He wants to restore you. He wants to, to bring you back to, to what, where you should be and where you could be. And he, he's willing to do that. But it happens when we acknowledge him as the Lord of our life. Here's the third and final thing I want to close with. The pathway to humility, it's simply to keep walking in it. Walk in humility. We've just got to keep going. We've got to keep pressing forward. If we want to stay healthy, we've got to stay humble. Proverbs 18 says this. It says, before his downfall, a person's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. I read a quote this week. It was actually from a mathematician, Blaise Pascal, and he said this. He said, do you wish people to think well of you? Don't speak well of yourself. And I'm just telling you, and I said this earlier, but if we, there's just something about people who are constantly lifting up themselves, constantly bragging about themselves, that are constantly just prideful. There's something about being around someone like that that just repels us. We just don't want to even be around them. But when you see somebody that is humble, it's amazing how God can use them. There's a story I read um, uh, uh, by Max Lucado, and he was talking about humility. He was talking about this story and this time he had with Michael W. Smith, and they were preparing for a a ministry weekend at the the Cove uh, near um, Asheville and and that's the Billy Graham you know, kind of training place. And he said this. He said, a few hours before the event, Michael Smith, Michael W. Smith and I met to go over the weekend schedule. But Michael could hardly discuss the retreat. He was so moved by what he had just experienced. He had just met with Billy Graham for the purpose of planning Reverend Graham's funeral. At this time, the famous evangelist was 94 years old. He was confined to a wheelchair on oxygen. His mind was still sharp and his spirits were high, but his body was, was seeing its final day. So he called for Michael. He called for his pastors, and he wanted to, d- to discuss his funeral. He told them that he had a request. They said, of course, anything you want, what is it? This is what Billy said. He said, would you not mention my name? What? Can you not mention my name? Just mention the name of Jesus. 
Billy Graham, he preached you know, over a billion people. He filled stadiums on every continent. He advised president, uh, every president over the last half century. He's been on the top of every most admired list, and yet at his funeral, he just said, I, I, just talk about Jesus. No need to talk about me. And you see, when someone humbles themselves like that, how God can use them. My question for you is, can we all, can, can all of us, can we get out of the way enough so that God can use us in a mighty way? Can we humble ourselves and exalt God so that he can use us? We live in a day and time where people like to make a big deal about themselves. But it means we have to get out of the way. We have to humble ourselves before God, and we have to exalt and lift up the name of Jesus. And we have to live our life in such a way that when people see us and when people encounter us, they don't really see us. They see Jesus living in us and through us. And if we can do that, I'm just telling you, this church can make an incredible kingdom impact on not just this community, but on the world around us. I fully believe that God is calling us. God is, is calling us to repent of our pridefulness, to prevent of our over-controlling ways and just say, God, I'm going to let you lead and I'm going to follow. I'm going to listen to what you say and I'm going to obey. And if we can do that, I'm just telling you, God can do an incredible work in your life. I want to ask the praise team to come back up. We're going to close with our time of response. We're going to pray um, I just want to challenge all of us to, to live our lives that way. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning. We're thankful for your word. It's convicting sometimes, but as we read, as we learn together, Lord, what you do, you call us into a deeper level of intimacy with you. And so I'm thankful for that, that as we read scripture, uh, we know more about who you are and what you have done in our lives, and we can thank you, we can exalt you for that. Lord, we repent of pridefulness. We repent of thinking this world is always about me and about us. And uh, Lord, just help us to get out of the way so that you can live and work through us. I pray for this church, Lord, that, the, that we could have a spirit of humility in everything that we do. That it would not be about making the name of Cornerstone great or lifting up the name of Cornerstone or always talking about Cornerstone. But it could be that we always talk about Jesus. That we just make Jesus the one that we all want to honor and exalt. Lord, um, we just thank you. And if there's anyone here that has not made you the Lord of their life, that has not surrendered to you, that they would confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. They would believe in the heart, God, that you raised Jesus from the dead, and your word tells us that we will be saved when we do that. So that's our prayer this morning. Um, just that we can submit, we can humble ourselves before you. Lord, we just thank you for your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.